The following is a fourth hand production. Welcome to another episode of the Juan on Juan podcast. I'm your host, Juan. On this episode, we talk to Dr. Michael P. Masters. Michael is a professor of biological anthropology at Montana Tech in Butte, Montana. He received a PhD in anthropology from the Ohio State University in 2009, where he specialized in human evolutionary anatomy, archaeology, and biomedicine. His book identified flying objects a multidisciplinary scientific approach to the UFO phenomenon challenges readers to consider new possibilities while cultivating conversations about our ever evolving understanding of time and time travel. Very interesting stuff and stuff that is way well above my pay grade. I hadn't realized how immense and how dense the information is in this book before I had read it. I thought it was just a regular alien book. But no, that's, it is far from it. He did a wonderful job in incorporating a lot of different aspects that you wouldn't normally think about when it comes to, first of all, the main theory that we are these aliens, but traveling through time, extra tempestrials, as he likes to call them, instead of extraterrestrials. And when it comes to time, I hadn't realized how how crazy and how complex time really is when you start thinking about all these different theories and all these different paradoxes and it truly did blow my mind but I had so much fun I'd been looking forward to this episode for months because obviously the circumstances that are happening right now we were able to do it earlier it wasn't supposed to happen until late in the summer but yeah, I loved it it was very fun a very cool conversation and Dr. Michaels is an awesome guy Make sure to check out his work. Make sure to follow us on social media at the Juan Juan Podcast. And follow the blog, the Juan Juan Podcast.com. Shoot me an email, the Juan Juan Podcast at gmail.com. And without further ado, this is Identified Flying Objects, Extra Tempestrials, and Time Travel with Dr. Michael P. Masters. All right, and we are live. Welcome to the show. Michael, how are you doing today? Good, how are you? Doing all right. I want to thank you for taking the time. I have been thinking about this episode since I reached out to you a few months ago. And given the circumstances, we don't say the C word anymore on this show. So just in case. <laughs> uh, what's cunt? No. <laughs> Coronavirus. Coronavirus. I see. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> that, to me, that was the C word. I, I couldn't. I, I was like, why would I just yeah. say that all of a sudden? <laughs> Which I ended up doing. You made me do that. Didn't it <laughs> it's all right, man. We can, you can say whatever you like on the show. There's no Oh, good. No it is a podcast, I guess. They don't have like the whole FCC rules. Yeah. Yeah. And again, I want to, it's a lot of information. And I want to emphasize, I know you don't like conspiracy theories. This isn't a conspiracy theory podcast, but I do like to think about things like that, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think we all should. I mean, anything should be uh, considered if it makes some sense. Yes. We will start with the first question I ask everybody that comes on the show. We might get, I want to talk about obviously the physical stuff. And a lot of the stuff that we're going to talk about is theory, hypothesis, just ideas that could, obviously with your background, and I want to emphasize you weren't just some random guy I found on Reddit or Twitter or Instagram or YouTube. You're an actual legitimate doctor and professor that works and has a background in what we're about to talk about. So just so the listeners know, you're not just some random guy who's coming up with these ideas. 
Well, that'd so, be okay too, I guess. Everybody yeah. has a right to contribute. But yeah. yeah, I mean, there is some value in having an, a, a college education and a PhD, I guess. It, it forces you to look at things in very detailed ways. Yes, and for, for those who don't know, this is uh, Dr. Michael P. Masters, and we'll get into that. And the first question I want to ask you, who is Michael P. Masters? Well, he's changed forms many, many times over the years. Um, I guess currently uh, I am a professor of biological anthropology at Montana Tech, which is a science and engineering school in southwest Montana, Butte, Montana specifically. Um, and I teach a number of classes in anthropology and sociology, and I just published a book, which is why I'm here this evening. It's called Identified Flying Objects, a Multidisciplinary Scientific Approach to the UFO Phenomenon. And it looks at the UFO question in the context of uh, time travel and human evolution, and specifically uh, the question of maybe they're just us from the future coming back to study their own past. Yes, and I love that. And before we get any further, Michael, can you plug in your information so people can find your book and it's not a, like i was telling you it is not a typical alien book it is very dense with a lot of information some of the topics covered time travel fermi's paradox astrobiology time bipedalism just to name a, a few of the different topics covered in that yeah yeah i mean i think the best way to understand this phenomenon is to look at it through a very broad lens and and that's why the subtitle it's a, a multidisciplinary scientific approach because it combines research from those four main fields uh, physics astronomy astrobiology and anthropology and especially evolutionary biology um, and and to try to build a case around that general model that they're they're us from the future they're doing the same things i would do as an anthropologist, if I had access to time travel technology, I would abduct our past ancestors and conduct scientific studies on them, biomedical examinations. So, um, yeah, I think I think uh, an interdisciplinary approach is the right way to go, and, and not just in the context of individuals doing it like I am, but in collaboration, working together across these different disciplines to really try to understand what's going on with this phenomenon. Yeah, can you plug in your information so people can find you and the book? Your social media, if you have any? Yeah, where do you want me to put that? Oh, I'm just saying you can say it on air now, so that way people... I'll, I'll ask you now and then at the end. Oh, so. okay. <laughs> I thought I thought there was like a thread going that you no, wanted to no, post just... some links into. <laughs> um, yeah, no, like I said, the book's identified flying objects. Um, really, at this point, if you just Google that, information will come up. Um, or my name... Uh, Dr. Michael P. Masters, but there's a, a website that has uh, a lot of information that leads you to the the Twitter and uh, Facebook and places where you can get the book and just learn more about it. Uh, that website is idflyobj.com, I-D-F-L-Y-O-B-J, just an abbreviated version of the book, idflyobj.com. Right on, and I'll have that in the show notes as well in the description. So people, I, I encourage people to look into this. And the and the the way I came across your your book was it was an article on obviously you know Google's tracking everything we do, and our phones are always listening to us at all times as we approach the singularity. And your I don't really buy the whole little green men idea, and yeah. the reason I like your your ideas because it it flips that right it's mm -hmm. what if these entities or these beings that people are saying that they see what if they actually are just us and yeah. from the future and coming to study how you said and how an archaeologist would study bones mm -hmm. they're coming and also you talk about some other things related to that uh, such as tourism so I don't even know where to begin because it's so much information, so little time. Well, I'm always interested to hear how people come across this research. Um, and, and yeah, if you if it was that space.com article that came out 
a couple months ago, one thing I said in there that I think really resonated with a lot of people is he, he we were talking about the Occam's razor approach, the simplest explanation. And the interviewer asked me, well, isn't it more logical that they came from a different planet? And I said, well, wh well we know we're here. We know mm -hmm. we're here now. We know we have this long evolutionary history where we've gotten more advanced in our, our culture and our technology. So the simplest explanation, at least based on what we do know, is that that will continue and we will be here. And if you throw in the time travel thing, then, then why not? Yes. And one of the things in the book, and I don't remember who you quoted it by, but it was be open minded, but not so much that your brain falls out. Yeah, Carl Sagan. That's a Carl Sagan quote. Carl Sagan, and obviously he has some a, a lot. He does that Cosmo show, doesn't he? Uh, you know, he hasn't really done much. He kind of had a disappointing career. It's unfortunate, <laughs> but yeah, no, he's he's amazing. He's he's published so many books, and um, yeah, Cosmos I think was his original baby back in the seventies. Um, he he helped craft the Voyager messages that went out. Uh, as part of the Voyager one and two missions, so yeah, he's 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 badass. Yeah, I, I love space. I have a telescope there behind me; it's covered up though. And I do, you know, amateur astronomy because I love these celestial bodies. And even though I'm, I don't buy the whole little green men, like I was saying, I I personally I believe that aliens are interdimensional. And maybe perhaps it's not interdimensional what I'm thinking about or what I perceive to be interdimensional. It might be just time travelers, right? That's why I like this well, so much. Yeah. Because it... Yeah. And I don't, I don't separate those. I think they're the same thing. Like if we're talking okay. about interdimensional, we are talking about uh, a, a time traveling human group from a, a different timeline. So it basically comes down to this this issue, and I talk about this in the book in the context of block time, this idea, which is the dominant worldview among physicists, that everything in the universe from the very beginning of the Big Bang to the very end moments of matter in this, this universe uh, already exists, and you move in and out of those, and everything's self-consistent. The other idea, the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, is that there's different timelines. So, that's where interdimensionality comes from. And if that's the case, they're still human. They're still uh, us and able to communicate with us and interbreed with us. They just come from a split in that, that different timeline. And, and honestly, even in block time, coming from the future, that is interdimensional. You are jumping across the fourth dimension specifically uh, in order to visit us. So, so I kind of see those as the same. And as I've told people a hundred times, I don't see this as being mutually exclusive with the extraterrestrial hypothesis either, that there still can be that. Yes. And I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but can you talk about what got you started writing in this subject? I know in the book, and you've been asked this a bunch of times about your father and his experience with a, with a UFO, but was that what actually got you started in this endeavor to write this book, which I believe it took you, what, six, seven years to write? Yeah, seven years. Uh, yeah, it did. It started when I was eight years old, and I heard a story uh, that my dad was telling to some friends at our house about um, his experience with the UFO. It was, it was your standard observing a bright light, and it moved rapidly this way. It came toward them, and then it moved away, and then it shot up into the sky. So it, it defies explanation based on things that we know of today. Um, and then specifically, he bought Whitley Strieber's book, Communion, and on the cover of it is a uh, sort of your archetypal gray alien. And I remember seeing it and then, uh, for whatever reason, just wondered if, if that could be us in the future. Just they kind of looked human, humanoid, hominin, as I later came to understand it. And that sort of got me curious about it and went on to study physics and astronomy and then to really pursue with my degree evolutionary biology in the context of anthropology biological anthropology specifically and and that's what i do now right on and you talk about confirmation bias in your book when it came to writing this 
how were you able to overcome that, right? Because we always want to believe. We always want the evidence to be aligned with what we believe. And I, you also mentioned, what was it? The absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, right? Yeah, yeah. And those are both logical fallacies. And one of the ways I did that is I printed out uh, the Ten Commandments of Logic, and I'm, I'm actually looking at it now because I put it right next to my desk. And then another one that puts them in the context of real life scenarios, just to constantly be reminded of what these logical fallacies are. And, and confirmation bias is an important one that we all deal with. It's not just um, in looking at the UFO question, are they from outer space? Are they from time? Are they from different dimensions? It's, it's something we should all do uh, because it's easy to get stuck in your own head and to start looking at things one way when there's all of these other ways that we should also be considering it. And, and like you said, the Carl Sagan quote, we should all have an open mind, but not so open our brain falls out. Um, the other way I dealt with confirmation bias was to just talk about this a lot with people. Like I remember back in high school, you know, smoking weed, looking at the stars, talking to my buddies about about this idea. And, and from then on, uh, not just, you know, smoking weed, but like with my colleagues and, and other people that I interact with, um, just to get different views and different ways of understanding it while still having that open mind that allowed me to challenge my own notions of this model and to think about it in ways that I hadn't before. Um, and, I, and I think that's important that, you know, we all do that with things that we believe and not just get bogged down in this one way of thinking. And so I tried to to overcome that confirmation bias by doing that. I also hired research assistants to help me with things that were blind to what we were doing. And that helps eliminate confirmation bias too. If you have people doing research that don't know why they're doing it, they'll produce results that mm. can help eliminate some of that bias. Yeah, I didn't know people did that. That, that is a good point. And it's it's hard though right because at times i call it obviously we're indoctrinated with certain beliefs and certain principles since the very beginning right and yeah we're, we're stuck with those all of our lives so it, it puts us in this box yeah and not not to throw shade at anything but obviously you have different things in in cultures and in with religion and all these different things different beliefs that sometimes limit your the way you think and your approach towards you know some things and one of the i talk about a lot of crazy stuff on this show and one of the my favorite quotes is by aristotle that he talks about and this is me paraphrasing it it's the mark of an educated mind to i think entertain thoughts uh, thoughts without accepting them and just because you talk about something doesn't mean you believe it at times right yeah. but when you talk about certain things people assume that you, that's what you believe. And like, for me, I'm a researcher. I'll regurgitate back information. I remember things, right? And I, and I connect dots what, whenever possible. But sometimes like people even attack me for some things that I said. And it's like, listen, man, you're asking me a question. I'm answering it from, it's just from my research. It's not my personal beliefs of whatever it is that we're talking about, right? Oh, I'm so glad you brought that up actually. Cause that's, it's a really important distinction. And, and you said it, right there at the end that there's there's a belief system and we have to separate beliefs from scientific evidence and it's hard for people to do that unfortunately and we're seeing that play out in real time uh i mean for, we have for the last couple of decades really with uh regard to climate change and all kinds of different scenarios that take place where the science can show something, it can demonstrate something based on statistical evidence, but it doesn't matter if people have a belief system and, and they disregard that, uh, it's not relevant to them. I grew up in a, a very religious household, evangelical, born again, Christian type household where belief was everything. It didn't matter what faith. science it's faith yeah it's faith in things and it doesn't matter what science says it's almost like scientists are demonized as being yes. against that but that's that's not the case what we do is 
is based in the scientific method. It's based in objective uh, evidence, and and it's fine if you have a belief. It's absolutely fine. I don't I don't demonize them the same way that they oftentimes demonize us. Uh, I understand that beliefs are important. They serve a social solidarity function, as Durkheim has said for hundreds of years. They serves a, a, a way for people to comfort themselves, especially in these difficult times. It's important, but we have to recognize the difference between belief and scientific evidence. Yes, I always talk about that. I talk about the, and I've, and I've had episodes with doctors in church history, theology, things of that nature, and there is a, what I call a literal comprehension to things, as well as a mystical comprehension is what I call it, because yeah. obviously look at the Dark Ages when people took religion in a literal sense and what happened then, right? You mm -hmm. have this craziness going on uh, to on the subject of beliefs and criticism. Did you face any criticism in regards to this piece of work that you did? Because I'm familiar with Egyptology and in that realm, the dogma and the ruthlessness of academia when it comes to changing the way people think about things. Um, you know, not really too much from anthropology in, in my field because nobody really talks about the future. I mean, it's, it, the future is stigmatized. We're not supposed to, even though, as I point out in the book, there's these very dominant trends that exist throughout six million years that we can't just ignore. Um, but no, it's, it's mostly been sort of a turning a blind eye to this in my field. There have been some uh, criticisms or I, I guess more not necessarily criticizing, but standoffishness within the UFO community. People that really adhere to the extraterrestrial model that they're from outer space and some of whom have built careers around this that uh, want that to be true or need that to be true. And, and it comes back to confirmation bias or really even beyond that, uh, building a brand around something, you know, talking something up so much that you have to stick to it. it ancient aliens. Just, oh, my God. I can't believe I was actually just about to say ancient aliens, you know, and it's funny uh, because I I've been on that show three times. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, I have. I was brought down there. And, and the season isn't over as far as I can tell. So maybe this will still air. But I was flown down there to do an interview about this question of time travel, right? And uh, may, maybe that'll still come out. Maybe it won't. Um, I can't really divulge anything about it. There's non-disclosure agreements and whatnot. Mm. But every time it comes up, whether I'm on or not, it seems like they're right on the cusp of that just about to say, oh, it could be time travel, and then they don't, and it's weird. And, I, and I've talked about this with a producer friend of mine who I'm working with on turning this book into a docu-series, and he said the exact same thing. We had this conversation about six or eight months ago where it's like they just they can't. They can't offer up something else because they use the word extraterrestrial for aliens. They say that every time they make reference to these these beings and their you talk, craft. You, you call them extra tempestrials. You replace the terror with. Yeah. And that's part of why I did that is to keep that continuity. But you're right in that particular program. They're so locked into that idea of they're from a different planet. They're extraterrestrials that I don't know if they can get out of. I'll be so interested to see <laughs> if all of the shit I said about time travel even ends up on that show, even though that's why they brought me down there. Like, all the stuff I talked about so far on the shows that have aired have been on three episodes this season. None of it had anything to do with what I actually do. Well, they would rather mix in Nazis and aliens and have alien Nazis than say that they're time travelers from another dimension, right? <laughs> yeah. It, anything other than that, it's weird. And it almost makes you wonder why. Like, is, is there some truth to that, or is it just brand protection i don't know it makes me curious because well, the produ the producers i work with are very keen to get that out there so clearly it's getting chopped up by some executive producers somewhere i, I don't know i'm just speculating here I, I don't actually know how the inner workings of this production company are but so something's strange about it and maybe it's just trying to to redirect or keep on brand i don't know 
Yes, I like to call it, and if let's say that there is and and this is conspiracy and I'm not, I'm not saying I'm speaking for myself and not for you. I like to call these higher powers at work the reptilian overlords. <laughs> that they are the ones that control everything and they probably want to censor certain things, right? And who knows what what blows my mind. I want to get your your opinion on this. When it comes to quantum computing, you have companies such as IBM, you have Google that supposedly is in the quantum computing race. They talk about you have you have CERN, you have Jody Rose, you have all these different companies, these weird shady companies that talk about all the we you you mentioned something such as the multiverse earlier, right? These different timelines, the multiverse mm-hmm. theory. They talk about how oh this computer is ten thousand years faster than this other computer. How would you know that unless you had a time machine, <laughs> right? Like it's, they yeah. throw around these numbers, right? Yeah. And I think, I mean, there is some sort of uh, modeling system that they do. I forget what it's called, but there's a name for it where every, in so many years, our computing capacity like doubles or quadruples or something like that. And, and we can definitely see that going back from the, the dawn of computers with these massive mainframes to being it shrunk down to a personal computer with Apple and, and a flash technology, Jesus Christ. Finally, we had flash drives and that's lasted for a while, but they're still shrinking those down. So maybe it's just based on that model would be my guess. Um, with quantum computing, it might, if it actually works, I have my doubts about it, but if it actually works, uh, that could propel us into that next stage of whatever that accelerating line is that I can't remember right now. Yeah, what freaks me out about these people, you have people such as Jody Rose from D-Wave Quantum Computers and I think it's called Kindred AI, where they the aliens, right, we're on the topic of aliens, he says that these aliens are, when they're essentially computing, it's very odd. And again, I, this is conspiracy theory they talk about, and but he's come out and said it, right? He talks about how it's an altar to an alien god and how it almost has a heartbeat and you have these big black cubes that are big giant computers. And he says that these aliens are, I don't know if you're an H.P. Lovecraft fan, he compares them to H.P. Lovecraft's great old ones, which are these big malevolent entities that are not good but then he comes out and says listen when we compute we're reaching into other parallel dimensions and we kind of sort of open up portals for these things to come through and they're not gonna he says they're not gonna give a shit about you just how you don't give a shit about an ant right yeah but they're not gonna do anything to us they're just gonna hang out and i'm like why would you even why would you even say something like that right why why what what's the point behind yeah. saying something like that. Well, if that's true, it it would sort of tie into the whole simulation theory too. Yes. Um where where then it's an aspect of of time travel, the multiverse and also the simulation idea which has uh gained popularity in recent time. So, it, yeah, who knows? I mean, I don't think we're at a point where we can know, but I would be hopeful that we could at some point in the future. Yeah, and let's talk about your theory in the book. So we mentioned extra tempestrials and obviously that you believe these beings are us because of the physical attributes. And not only that, but you have a background in evolution. Am I correct? Yeah, absolutely. That's the main thing that I do. And and uh, yeah, it's, it's a, a, a PhD in paleoanthropology biological anthropology specifically so yeah that's what we do we study human evolution and again and you can stop me and correct me at any time because i'm not a scientist i don't have a background with this again i'm just trying to keep up with you because i i when i was actually looking into and i had scheduled the the interview with you i was like i think i might have bit off more than i could chew (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh, whatever, man. No, I love I love talking to everybody about this. I if I was only talking to my academic peers, that uh, it's bullshit. I'd be doing a disservice to our knowledge as uh, in our field. 
Like it, it's unfortunate too. Like I feel like that's one of the failings of anthropology is that we read all these papers, we present at these conferences, and we think, oh great, like all of these grad students think I'm awesome and they follow me around at this conference with 10, 30,000 people. Um, but you're not actually communicating with the people who are also interested in this. So many people are curious about human evolution and about our culture and biology and how it's changed. Um, so I've, I've really enjoyed this UFO side of it because I get to talk to people about what we do in this field, but in a way that I hope everybody understands, not just people at the conference who are already doing this and already have PhDs. So if I would say the same thing, if I say something that's overly technical, definitely call <laughs> me out and let me know and I'll, I'll reword it in the best way I can. So you talk about in the book and you quoted this, you also quoted Marcelo Gleiser. And yeah. he says, if aliens were going to destroy human civilization, they would have done it by now. Because when you think of aliens and you think of extraterrestrials, you think of these little green men with advanced, with advanced technology from another planet who are going to come down and destroy humanity, right? Yeah. So, and you go and say, and it's one of my favorite quotes in the book, because aliens are not going to kill us all, right? They would, have, they, they would have to be advanced enough to even find us because... Another thing is the vast, the sheer vast size of the entire space. It's so mm. mind boggling to me. But you said this could be the equivalent to riding a bike all the way to Pluto to smash a fly and steal a tater tot from someone. From someone. <laughs> <laughs> that was my favorite quote Man, in the book. <laughs> there was so much more of that in the book, too. And then my editors <laughs> made me take it out. And I was like, come on, man. I love it's fun. It's fun. It's, yeah. <laughs> it, it makes it relatable, but yeah, yeah, when you think of of these these beings, you think of that right destruction. But then it makes me think of Admiral Byrd when he met the advanced civilization inside Hollow Earth. Supposedly, that it's always these beings that tell us to what to not destroy mankind, not to destroy yeah, ourselves with these exactly. nuclear weapons. You have the Ashtar Galactic Command, this transmission, I think it was in the 1970s that came through and it was this alien saying not to, you know, to put down the nuclear weapons and all this craziness. It's always yeah. the same thing. Uh, allegedly Truman was advised to stop nuclear testing. Like the, there's an idea that I guess has been backed up by some things that he met with them being our extra tempestrial descendants and they said hey shut it down this is destroying the planet and we live on this planet so yeah and i, I think that's what you were saying i didn't mean yeah. to, to no, no, interrupt yeah. and usurp it but it seemed like that's where you were going that why would they care why would they give a shit if they don't have a stake in what we're doing here if they lived on a different planet, if they had advanced technology, they would have taken over so long ago. They would have stolen everything that we have. But if they're us in the future, it might explain that benevolence or that caring about who we are. And, and our, they have a stake in our survival. They would exist as our descendants. So I've had a, a number of friends tell me, one of my best friends uh, read the book, and he said, man, I've been afraid of... Um, an alien invasion since I was a kid. Like there, was, he watched something, he saw a movie, and he was Independence like, oh, no. Day. <laughs> That's probably what it was, actually. Yeah. I don't know. We might be a lot older, than that, but <laughs> um, but yeah, he, he articulated this to me, and then he's like, "I read your book, and I thought, well, I, I don't worry about that anymore because you made a good case. I think you're right, and if you are right, why the hell would they ever do that?" Uh, the same thing with. With all of these things like global warming and all of the, the, the virgin soil pandemics and shit we're dealing with, like if this model is correct, it indicates that we are going to survive, that we're going to persist and we're going to really, um, I, don't, I don't know, succeed in the future to the extent that we develop the technology and the material sciences and the engineering to return to the past and I think I think it's comforting in a way. Well, when you when you talk about this, it makes me think of obviously everybody talks about the singularity, how AI is going to be the end of us, that we're going to be able what Elon Musk, right? We're going to be able to download our consciousness into a computer by the end of 2030 or some some crazy number and they want to yeah. put a, a million people on Mars by the end of 
uh, 20, what, 2050 or some crazy number, right? This guy is, is so out there. And it makes me think, because you, you talk about time, and I didn't realize how complex time really was until I started, I listened to the book. And, I, and when I was listening, I was like, telling my fiance, I'm like, man, Time is really fucking complex. All these different <laughs> theories, all these different paradoxes and all these things. And I was like, are you trying to tell me, and Michael, you can tell us, that Back to the Future had it all wrong <laughs> from the beginning? <laughs> uh, yes. That's one of few questions that I would answer in an affirmative yes. Like, yeah, think about it. Like, you, you go back in time, your parents don't get together. You're suddenly like just like rocking out at this massive music hall and everybody's into you and you invent rock and roll. Um, and then you start disappearing like that. There's so many things that are it's wrong. The butterfly with that. effect, no? Yeah, kind of. Uh, it, it's definitely a part of it. And, and the problem is that if you if you look at time in those ways, there are paradoxes. But what's weird is if you look at time in the way that physicists understand it, there aren't. And, and that was one of the parts about writing this book that was the most fun for me is just really getting into that. Because, yeah, we watch movies, we watch TV shows, and we get this idea of how time travel works. You know, I got to mention, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure yeah. actually got a lot of it right. Like, they, as ridiculous as that movie was, and I, I loved it to death, so I say ridiculous in the sense of, uh, yeah, it was dumb as shit. But they actually <laughs> did do a really good job adhering to the self-consistency principle. And I remember, um, I don't remember if it was Bill or Ted. I think it was Bill. He was like, all right, you got to remember the trash can. And then all of a sudden a trash can came down on his dad's head at the police station. Oh, my God, I haven't seen this movie in like 30 years, but I still remember all these scenes. <laughs> And, and but I started thinking about it later, like that, that is how self-consistency works. That is how time travel would work. What it didn't show is him up above putting the trash can on his dad's head. So there'd be two of him, which we also see as paradoxical, but it's not. If future him was there doing that because he knew he was supposed to, that's still completely self-consistent. So you're right. It seems weird. It's more complicated but if you look at it in a way we understand it in the terms of philosophy and physics, uh, it, it's, it's doable. There aren't really paradoxes. It's just when you watch TV shows and shit that it gets all fucked up. Can you talk a little bit about one of the, the concepts that I had a hard time grasping? Obviously, obviously, you have Einstein's theory of relativity and how what when you were talking about that if somebody was to obviously I, I'm a Star Wars fan, Star Trek, you have these different movies, aliens that they jump into hyperdrive, right? And they're traveling at the speed of light. Can you talk a little bit about traveling at the speed of light and why that wouldn't be all they make it out to be? Because you said that the people who are traveling, they would age quicker than the people who are seeing them. Yeah, absolutely. Um so hyperdrive as an idea is this i it's it's the concept that you could go faster than light um so there's been a lot of indications that that isn't possible um simply because of and this gets to the first part of your question the inertial forces so uh einstein early on i think it was 1908 he recognized that time is relative before this uh newton said that time is an absolute thing that's just out there we all sense it the same way regardless of where we are einstein recognized that it's actually relative to the observer and all of it is relative to the speed of light so the idea of hyperspace as you see in star wars and star trek and the oroville and all of these um science fiction shows and movies is that you're traveling faster than the speed of light you're moving across space at this tremendous speed uh you get there in a short period of time you somehow don't crash into random <laughs> bits of things <laughs> floating around i don't know how they calculate all of that maybe they have shielding or something um but but that's probably not possible because of inertial forces uh simply as you 
travel faster, your mass increases exponentially to the mm. point where once you reach the speed of light, 300,000 kilometers per second, the mass of your spacecraft and you and all of the stuff you have and all of the shits you took and the bathroom that are clogging up the toilet, all of those things become exponentially massive so that you can't have enough fuel. You can't push yourself to that speed beyond the speed of light. Your second question was about what's called the twins paradox. This idea that if you move um, at a high rate of speed, of even a fraction of the speed of light, and we see this all of the time with aircraft, uh, we, we experience this just because we're traveling faster and or we're up off of the earth, which also adds this effect. But if you travel at a high rate of speed, time moves slower for you. It compresses time and space. So a, a clock in your reference frame within your craft is traveling slightly slower. You don't feel it. You don't feel like you're moving in slow motion. Just your whole bubble, what's called a reference frame, time is moving slower. So back on Earth, where they're not in that craft, it's moving at the same speed. So you essentially just slow down time. So, and they call it the twins paradox because you get back to Earth, uh, you meet your identical twin, and they're suddenly 5, 10, 100 years older, depending on how long you were gone or how fast you were moving. And, and that's just uh, uh, an aspect of Einstein's theory of special relativity. So it's it's that time and space are relative in your particular reference frame. Yeah, and he talks about how Earth is spinning. It mm -hmm. wraps time around itself. Yeah, I know. That's wild. And the gravity of Earth and also its rotation have an effect. It's, uh, it's something we can measure, and we have. There's been a lot of really interesting studies that have demonstrated it. Yeah, and, and on that same subject is why you think and on the subject of time travel, why you think that these crafts are actual time machines themselves. That's why we have that disc shape and it might be spinning or have some certain technology that it causes it for them to be able to travel through time or through different dimensions. And you also talk about the light that you have to point the light in the direction of the time you want to go. Um, Kind of. So that, that part is uh, in relation to light cones. And uh, if you think of an ice cream cone, uh, at the very base of it, at the bottom of the ice cream cone is, say that moment you shine a flashlight, you turn on the flashlight. So light is radiating out from that point. And because, as I just mentioned, light is uh, sort of the speed limit of the universe, nothing can go faster than that. Uh, that creates that cone where only things within that can be physical reality because nothing can come outside <laughs> of that cone. So That's it so creates a, a barrier, essentially, to what could happen within the physical universe. So the way in which we would return to the past is to tip that light cone over. Where you're still moving forward, everything within the laws of physics is still completely acceptable Except if that light code's turned over, if you flip it upside down, your ice cream's going to fall out, unfortunately, in this hypothetical scenario. But now you can move into the past. It just reorients it downward toward the past. And that, oh. that happens um, because of some solutions to Einstein's field equations. He published his general theory of relativity in 1915, what we were talking about earlier with the twins paradox, traveling at a high rate of speed relative to others on Earth, that was a special theory of relativity. And then his general theory of relativity showed us that that time dilation can happen next to a massive body, like we were talking about with Earth, how Earth creates that same effect. But it also, he, he published 10 uh, field equations and a solution only three years later with Lenz and Thuring showed that uh, the rotation of a massive body could reorient those light cones, that ice cream cone mm. of time toward the past. And then a number of others, uh, I mentioned in the book, Van Stockham, uh, Godel, Tipler as prominent examples, all demonstrate the same thing. That if you have a massive energetic body rotating, it can create that time dilation effect to reorient those light cones. And, and, and yeah, I mentioned in, 
that in the book because that's what these UFOs are, is they're, they're large, highly energetic, rotating disks in the same way that all of these people have been describing since 1915 when Einstein published that. So I, I think if we look at that objectively in the context of this UFO phenomenon, we can see some pretty interesting correlates there. Yeah, and it makes me think of the movie Avengers Endgame when he figures out time travel, where he's like, run simulation, and then out of nowhere, it's like, success. He's like, oh my God, I figured out time travel. Have you seen that movie? I haven't seen that one, no. Yeah, it's, it's really wild, but they they were trying to do different experiments of trying to travel through time to stop Thanos, and in some of the scenes, they would, instead of traveling through time, time would travel through them. So they would like uh, appear as a baby or appear really old, and it's because they were doing uh, it all wrong. That's awesome. <laughs> that's hilarious. I've never seen that twist on it. One one of my favorites. I mentioned Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure for whatever fucking reason, um, but a really good one is Dark. It's a a show out of Germany called Dark, and it it really nails the whole self consistency thing. And I I think I've seen that. Have you? I, I is it on Netflix? Yeah, it's dubbed over in English. Yeah, uh, yeah, I didn't get into it, but I started watching get it. Get into it, dude. You will love it. It's really, really good. And and you get you get past the dubbing thing after like five minutes. It yeah. starts, and you're like, oh, their mouths are weird. And then you completely <laughs> forget that that's even happening. But in the context of what we're talking about in the show, that self-consistency thing, it's they nail it. And it's really good. It's really entertaining, too, even beyond that. It's just a, it's a damn good show. Yeah, I don't know if you've seen the show The Expanse. Where oh, they, yeah. Love it. Love that show. Love, love that, that show. show. I binge-watched the entire second season in like two days. Yeah, and did you do you know the story behind that show? I don't think so. That Jeff Bezos was a big fan, and when they canceled the show, he bought the rights to the show. and uh, started... That's how it ended up on Amazon? <laughs> yeah. That yeah. makes sense. <laughs> Somebody should do that with Firefly. There's a huge cult following of Firefly. Never and... heard of that. Somebody needs to buy that too. It's it's a space travel show. It's like it's sci-fi, like all these other ones. But no, I love the Expanse, and I I thought they did a good job keeping it going too. Yeah, I, I wonder if Bezos was like an executive producer, or he just kind of left it alone but kept them going. If I had that much money, I would just be like, hey, how much do you need? Just make it happen. Don't tell me anything. I'm just gonna watch it. <laughs> yeah, I think I would too. I wouldn't want to know. I wouldn't want to try to micromanage it or mess up the the good thing they had going so so it's coming back for a third season then too i think it's already uh, they, they came out with a new season not too long ago a couple of months ago what yeah seriously yeah oh i was God. i started watching it yeah they came out with a new season not too long ago. i think it was season let me double check here the expanse has got four seasons so they came out with the four season not too long ago oh man all right i've watched all of them i just thought we were on season three for some reason no there's season four now you can That's watch probably it it's probably because i watched season four in two days that it didn't even seem like i watched the whole season <laughs> it's just like what that happened wasn't yeah. it just one episode so the whole time travel thing which i think they i forgot what the show was about but they go through like a wormhole and i i i know i don't know you talk about black holes about uh, time through a black hole, am I correct? Uh, yeah, a little bit. Mostly in the context of space travel. But yeah, it interstellar would, travel. Yeah, it would also make you travel through time. There's no way around that. Yeah, so the whole time travel, you, you throw... Obviously, they're, they are time machines, the actual disks themselves. That's why they're they're circular in shape and all this craziness. And you also throw in the idea that perhaps it's it's got to do with tourism as well because this whole tourism thing makes me think of Elon Musk and how innovative he is and how if we do reach singularity in our lifetime and Elon Musk just finds a way to live forever because that's the whole thing of transhumanism, right? Living forever. <laughs> and he can just put his consciousness in some, super, some supercomputer and finds a way to to time travel and just start the business from it just how he did with spacex right he jumped into an industry that was untouched and had no no competition and profited from it with a with a background of, of zero knowledge right and then it blows my mind again that's how innovative he is that's and how I, rich he was too because he made all his money off of paypal which yeah. allowed him to do that yeah there's probably was, a lot of people that could 
do what he did that just didn't have the the capital. Yeah, and obviously he funded Tesla, SpaceX, and I mm-hmm. I live in Florida, so I, I've been to Kennedy Space Center and I've seen where they launched the the shuttles from. But yeah, you talk about that about how it could be tourism, and it, it would make sense, right? If you could pick any any point in time, where would you go? And where would you go, Michael? If you could pick any point in time, anywhere, where would you go? Um, I I mean, there's a lot of places in human prehistory and hominin evolution that I study, um, that I've studied the fossils and the stone tools that I would love to just set down and watch, that I would love to be there and see what they're doing and uh, really get to know their culture and, and study their physical form, their physiology in great detail. But there's also a ton of points in history, too. I think I think it's hard to pick one in particular that I would just... Uh, I don't know. I, I guess... It'd be fun to live in some too. Just have them drop me <laughs> off and and hang out there for a while. I don't so you know. come out in an ancient painting. It's like, oh, there's Michael, right? Hanging yeah. Out with, with... Yeah. You, you show up and <laughs> you know you see yourself when he, if they do pick you back up to go home, you see yourself in the Mona Lisa or something, just wearing a weird hat and obviously being a dude because I think she was a woman in that. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of places that I would go. A lot of times I would go. We do that all the time. We confuse time and space, even conversationally. We talk about a time that was as a place. And I just did it. I wrote a freaking book about it and I just did oh, it yeah. too. But there's a lot of different times I would go. And I, I think it's hard to pick one. Um, With that said, Michael, do you believe, because obviously you have the observer effect, do you believe that if we travel back in time, if we ever find the way to do it, there would be no effect then, right? If there's the observer effect, there there would be if you would just travel in time, it already happened, right? Because you said yeah. that yeah. time is just eternal and it's already happened, right? The whole multiverse yeah. and everything's already happened. Well, I mean, there is an effect. It's just that effect had already played out prior to you being there, before you even left to go back there. That's that self consistency aspect of it. Um, where if you, if you go back and, and do things in the past, it, it doesn't disrupt it. It's non-disruptive. You just are doing what you always already have done. Yeah. And you're just kind of fulfilling that thing that was a part of the past that leads up to whatever future you already existed in. Yeah. And, and that's, that's not my idea. That's just, that's what physicists uh, agree on as being the the way in which that intrusion into the past would work. Uh, the reason I ask is because of all again because of all these movies I've been indoctrinated to believe that right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, it, then that's where that whole butterfly effect comes from. That you do something that changes everything, or the Mandela then, effect. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and 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 that that's more in in the lines of uh, the many worlds interpretation. Yeah. that I mentioned earlier in, in the realm of quantum mechanics where there's different timelines and, and that we get a sense of these other timelines or some people claim to have experiences that make them feel like they were in that timeline, but they're more anchored in this one. Um, and and we, won't, we don't know. We don't know that the answer to that question now, and we won't until we have uh, a comprehensive theory of, of, of gravity and quantum mechanics. Yeah. And it's it's all very interesting. It blows my mind, right? It's it's also it makes me think of Rick and Morty when he travels through dimensions and there's a bunch of them and, <laughs> and it's all crazy. Um with your background in evolution, the other part of your theory as well is that you believe that we'll eventually reach what we what we consider the typical alien gray because one they're so similar to us they have the same features. And can you talk I, I really like your talk on how the evolution of the homo sapiens sapien as we know it today with the increasing of the size and brain and the decreasing in the size of the face I, what do you call it globular globulation i forgot the name of it yeah globular neurocranium yeah can you talk a little bit about that because that's also very interesting well the main trends in human evolution since we stood upright uh, since we started walking bipedally, as we say it. Bipedalism, locomotion, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, bipedal locomotion, exactly. 
So most primates who are closest living relatives, and we share a common ancestor with them going back about 62 to 65 million years ago, um, are quadrupedal. We walk like dogs or horses or any other land mammal. But we stood upright beginning about 6 million years ago. And as we stood up, for whatever reason, and there's a lot of good ideas about why that happened, our, our heads had to rotate down so that we could see where we were going. And as our heads rotated down, uh, that created a lot of changes in our skull, one of which was just an expansion of the brain case. So our, our neurocranium started to get bigger. Our faces started to get out of the way because the, the brain grows first and then the face grows. And, and one thing I compare this to in the book is if you look at domesticated dogs, you've got uh, collies and Doberman pinchers who have these really long faces and low sloping foreheads, or you have like pugs and chihuahuas that have tiny faces and big round heads. Mm -hmm. And that's how it's happened throughout human evolution is that we've trended toward those more rounded head, smaller face characteristics. And we can see that clearly leading up to right now. So if those same trends uh, continue into the future, we are likely to have uh, an even more uh, accelerated, possibly, because it has been accelerating recently. Uh, we're, we're likely to see that even more in our evolutionary future. And you mentioned neurocranial, glo neurocranial globularity specifically. That's when we get a rounded head. And that's something pretty recent. That's actually a characteristic of Homo sapiens sapiens, our own individual species and we've got big round heads and tiny faces and and these alien forms would seem to have that too yeah and that's that's the that's one of the part of the evidence that you talk about obviously because when other people talk about aliens extraterrestrials oh they're come they just come from other planets right because if there's so many planets there's got to be life out there and yeah, you hear that all the time you hear it all the time right fermi's paradox uh, where well where is everybody if there is all this life and you talk about that, and another thing that really blew my mind, and, and a remarkably interesting idea that you that you talked about in your book is that these other, if there was other extraterrestrial lives, let's throw that out there, that they're not what we would think of them to be, right? We think of these bipedal creatures. That you bring up the comparison of that maybe because of the different gravity levels on different planets and the masses of different planets that. Other life forms, perhaps they wouldn't they wouldn't even be bipedal because bipedal locomotion it wrecks pretty much havoc on our on our body, right? We we're the one of the species with the most issues with joints and things of that nature. Is that correct? Yeah, it, it is indeed. Um, we it's it's called the perils of bipedalism. In fact, a uh, uh, an anthropologist by the name of Bruce Latimer who used to be the head of the uh, Cleveland Museum of Natural History in Ohio, he, um, he wrote this paper and demonstrated all of these different ways in which standing upright fucked us. Like it, it gave us knee problems and back problems and hemorrhoids and varicose veins. Uh, we, we can choke. We're one of the only mammals that can choke and die from getting really? something stuck. And yeah, because no, no other mammal has this configuration. As our heads rotated down, it created this 90-degree angle in our larynx. Because primates look straight up, right? If you stand them up, they look straight up. That's yeah. what you talk about. Yeah, exactly. I mean, most walk like every other mammal. So there's all these things that we struggle with. Uh, fainting is another one. It's hard <laughs> to pump blood back up to our brains because our heart is below our brains. But if you think about other mammals, their heart's more or less in line with their brains. The brains are much smaller. Ours both require a lot of blood and oxygen, but also for it to be pushed up there. So, yeah, it, and, and if, if we have these problems on a planet with 9.8 meters per second squared gravity on other planets, and most of which, only 2.2% of planets outside of Earth uh, that they've found as, as part of the Kepler mission and all of the Arecibo studies they've done, only 2.2% are smaller or the same size as Earth. So that means most 
are not just bigger, but much bigger than our planet. And, and to think with all of the problems that we have here, that bipedalism could arise there and that these bipedal aliens could come here from those planets, uh, just doesn't really make sense. Yeah. Yeah. Because you said that they might not even be bipedal. They might be, they might not even move, right? You said that they yeah. might t develop tentacles or something to grab onto things because it's just so it wrecks havoc on our bodies just to get up and yeah, exactly. that constant battle between gravity and it, very interesting stuff and i love all of this and i wanted to get your opinion obviously you're a, a scholar and you talk about the origins of the homo sapien sapien and obviously they talk about that we're x amount of years old and obviously to me, I believe that time is a human construct. You have Scaligarian chronology, which is the AD and BC system of time that we know as it, uh, of it, that we know of time as, as we know it today. Uh, what do you think about all these numbers that we essentially made up, right? Like, how can you say that the universe is 13.8 billion years old? Uh, how, like, obviously you study, you study evolution, how do you deal with something like that, right? Like how, and I know you've talked about that missing link, right? People want to, oh, we're missing something. Well, maybe we're not, right? Because that confirmation bias, you want all the evidence to point towards what you want to believe. And I've been guilty of this because I talk about ancient civilizations. I talk about the Anunnaki theory of the whole, how our brain expanded so exponentially in what, uh, 7,000 years ago or something like that that they say that the modern civilization was established and they have all these crazy how oh. aliens genetically modified us and they, you know, boom, yeah. we were able to do the things we were able to do, right? Um, I haven't really looked into that theory much. What We, we did develop agriculture about ten to 12,000 years ago and that definitely ushered in a new period of human evolution but it, there's really no evidence that that came from any sort of star people or a different civilization or anything like that. I mean, it, it it's possible. Anything's possible. But again, it comes down to belief and evidence. We have to look at what we actually have versus what we think could be. And and we can come up with any any sort of ideas about what what humans came from or where we would be going and 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 that's you know part of the problem with this book and why it's so easily dismissible by my colleagues if if they choose to do so because um we can just turn away from the evidence it's human nature though right to to know the origins of the universe of humanity and the reason i don't believe we'll ever know talking about albert einstein and we'll start winding it down here because we're coming up on the hour uh, no problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it, right? We we won't probably won't ever know, and in, in our yeah. lifetime or many lifetimes to come, because we're in the petri dish together. Yeah. There's no way you can study it if you're in the damn petri dish, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I would like to get back to your initial question, though. To be honest, I just forgot what you asked, so that's why I rambled on. How do you <laughs> how do you but, deal with the numbers of these big yeah, numbers? Yeah. And, and, astronomical uh, units one light year seven trillion miles how do you even right. comprehend that right i know and usually i have a pad of paper where i write down what people are saying so <laughs> that sorry. i can uh get back to the question and not get lost but there's a fork sitting on it right now with some cheese that i <laughs> ate earlier so i can't write this down um and i guess it's a podcast you can edit all that out if you want to but regardless, um, yeah, so time, you're right, it's subjective. It's a human construct. But the best we could do is use a standard metric in order to try to understand it. And, that, and that's what we did. We used the Earth spinning around once uh, as a day, the moon going around 28 point whatever times as a month. And so we come up with these metrics. Obviously, the Earth going around the sun once as a year. And even before we um, were able to study these things celestially and understand them in the context of what's happening with the solar system, we still judge time by that because it's, it's, it repeats. It's regular. So 
there is at least a standard metric. Our, our subjective view of time is definitely completely different. Our consciousness, how it perceives time, does not fit neatly into that spinning earth or moon going around or us going around the sun. And, and we see this any time that we go to sleep or do mushrooms or anything that gets us to view this pattern differently. Um, but it does still exist. We have a metric, and that's all we can do to look at the past. So when we say that Australopithecus afarensis lived 3.4 million years ago, it's still based on that same metric of a day being one rotation of the earth. So yeah. we, we can at least, that's all we have. We can communicate about things based on these arbitrarily chosen celestial things, but that that's the best we can do. It's all we have. I don't know if we all just made up a, a concept of time or try to talk about our subjectivity of time when we're all tripping on mushrooms, it would never work. We have to have a standard and, and that's the best we can do, I guess. Yeah. It's funny you bring up mushrooms. I wanted to get your opinion on Terrence McKenna's stone ape theory. And oh, before we get into that, you talk about obviously about how different cultures and different languages perceive time and correct me if I'm wrong, you, you, cause they don't have a way to, describe what it is right and again this, t t touching on the subject that we're talking about right now defining what time is and yeah yeah some some cultures don't have words for it some relatively few most cultures do uh but some don't even have really a concept of the future where they they kind of think about think about as walking backward into the future where you can see everything that came before, yeah. so that's what you talk about. But you can't see what's behind you, so you just don't talk about it. There aren't words for it. But yeah. um, mo most societies do, though. Most societies do have ways of understanding it. Yeah, and Alan Watts talks about the eternal now. He talks about how there is no future, mm -hmm. and there is it's just all now. And that's back block to the, time. That's essentially block time. Yeah, exactly. we live in the now. <laughs> yeah, we live in the now, and it's always now. Like, think about it. Think about separating this now from the now when you got up in the morning or yeah, now. There's no way. Ten, there, it's all, yeah, the, cognitively, psychologically, there's no way to do that. Yeah. yeah and and the, on, the topic of, on the topic of mushrooms, how do you feel about Terrence McKenna's stoned ape? They call it a, a theory, but it's actually a hypothesis, right? How do you feel about that? Are you familiar at all with it? Yeah, I am actually. Um, I think it's interesting. There's a couple with your of... background. And sorry to interrupt you. Coming from a person with your background, how do you feel about it? Because I have, obviously I've talked to people about it, but not a person who studies fucking evolution, right? <laughs> right. So from an evolutionary standpoint, I guess you're right. If I offered my beliefs, it would be different than what I can offer from my background. Um, you can share both of you. Like, all right. Well, let's start with the science part of it. There are some problems in the sense that if human consciousness really leaped forward once we found psychedelics, it wouldn't explain how it all sort of happened uh, equilaterally across space around the same time. Um, meaning that there's certain psychedelics in some places there's other ones in other places, mm -hmm. and we didn't find them all at the same time. So you would expect these little jumps in consciousness. There's also the problem with heredity. We're talking about something that we eat, we consume. It might make us talk about things differently, but we're not passing down genes that were affected by peyote or psilocybin or something like that. It has to be heritable in order for it to really affect our evolution, uh, it has to be in our genes for it to really affect who we are as a species. And there, there is no heritability. I could drink 15,000 cups of coffee a day and then go make a baby and my kid's not going to come out of spaz instantly yeah. because that's not how drugs work. Um, there's also, so th those are from the science side. There's also the belief side. Uh, allegedly, I had consumed mushrooms before. I'm not sure if that's true or not, but that's what the tabloids say. 
And one really? thing, one thing that I allegedly remember from that situation is that you can't take things back with you very easily. You can have the most mind bending experience, but you can't necessarily always remember those the next morning when you wake up. You can't say, oh man, I met God and we talked about this and that. and We had such a great conversation. I'm going to write all this into a book. Timothy Leary struggled with this as well. Mm -hmm. One of the pioneers of this industry where, where how do you bring back that connection with the ether, the ethos, with the, the this, LSD guy, right? With God. Yeah. Yeah. Cause LSD is the same thing. It, it to, to me, mushrooms and LSD are parallel just with fewer stomach issues. Um, so how do you, how do you bring that information back? And, and there's almost sort of a, a barrier there, like a firewall, if you will. So, so if that's the case in human history, if we were eating these psychedelics, not just mushrooms, but many of the other hundreds of kinds of psychedelics, um, how, how would it interject itself into our consciousness in a way that we could take it with us both individually and also in a heritability context where it could be um, passed down to our offspring. To me, that doesn't really make sense. Yeah, yeah, and I, I can see where you're coming from, but the, the reason, the way they talk about it is that, you know, it, it made a leap, the, their creativeness, their art became more, much more vibrant, and I, I'd, I also, say I'd also like to point out, yeah, I'd also like to point out a correlation, though, that that same time, when all of those things made a leap was when we developed agriculture. And if we're settling down, we're having larger civilizations, and we're also eating different things and trying new things, I, I think it's probably just a correlation. We're also eating you know, strange things that mm -hmm. made us trip out. Uh, that's when beer was invented. That's when yep. rice wine was invented. That's when all, all kinds of different alcohols. It's when we started cultivating opium, coca. It's when drugs came about and that's when we saw this leap but it wasn't because of them it was probably just I got you. of it i got you i got you yeah yeah and to wrap up i wanted to yeah that's the one of the main points i, re I really wanted to get your opinion on that and have you seen the movie prometheus uh i ha no i haven't actually oh my goodness you're gonna have to check that movie out then i guess we can't talk about it <laughs> it's an it's a it's a part of the alien franchise it's pretty much the first it's supposed to be the first movie in the whole alien series of how the xenomorph came to be and i highly recommend it it's pretty much the same thing we're talking about now but they add a twist to it of uh, finding the correlation between all these ancient civilizations these same paintings these same depictions and they found a, a star system that matched up with the paintings that they were finding all throughout these different ancient civilizations and they traveled to that planet to find what they called the engineers uh, the mm. people who made us right and yeah. it, it gets really crazy and weird and i, I really recommend if, if you like tripping movies like that and i would recommend watching it while on mushrooms because it is very <laughs> <laughs> man i can't do mushrooms i haven't done mushrooms for years <laughs> Al allegedly i never actually did them but no i i i'm i'm old now you don't get to do that stuff as much when you're old yeah, and one more thing uh, on the topic of mushrooms. I was listening to other interviews that you were doing. You are currently diving into the realm of consciousness. And obviously, I, I study, I've studied the Gnostics and all these people who essentially believe what quantum physics is trying to prove now, the correlation between consciousness and the material world. And how do you feel about these people who were talking about the brain and how it's growing telepathy there's been people in groups with high doses of mushrooms who reported almost uh, like telepathic powers between the groups and being able to and there's no really not really a lot of studies when it comes to that sort of thing do you believe we could eventually develop telepathy maybe because a lot of these these encounters that people have with these extra tempestrials they talk about that they're almost being talked to telepathically yeah they do it's it's um if 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 this is happening and if it is a real phenomenon there's no doubt that telepathy is a part of it and and as i talk about in the book 
it's either an aspect of our brains evolutionarily, which, which you just mentioned, that we just evolve that capability, which obviously involves our consciousness, or it's some sort of implant into the brain that allows them to do that with us. And and I don't I think it's the former. I think it's and it's not just telepathy. Like it, this wasn't in the book, but I've garnered from so many people I've talked to have had these experiences that they're also able to uh, shift our consciousness to remember things in certain ways. Where mm -hmm. a lot of kids, especially who are abducted, will have. Uh, a memory of like Mickey Mouse trying to lure them out of bed and then they get taken into like a carnival ride through this light, which is the UFO, where they're, they're able to not just talk to us through our brains, but manipulate our memories. Our reality which, as well. Bro. Our reality, yeah, because that's happening in real time. That's not just a memory per se. I mean, we can't know the di distinction there, whether it's happening as it's happening or if they just remember it that way when their minds are erased later because everybody has a cloudy memory. Um, but no, I, I do think it's an aspect of our brains. Uh, I think some people already have inclinations of that today. A lot of people have the ability to uh, communicate, not necessarily telepathically, but sense people's energy and emotion and thoughts. Uh, many people have precognition empathy i think is a part of that sliding scale so yeah i mean it's it's speculation but i do think that in the future we'll we'll have that yeah we can't if we can't time travel i'll trip interdimensionally how my buddy adam says because when you take mushrooms you're tripping interdimensionally because <laughs> it puts yeah. you in a, puts you in another realm but definitely to wrap up michael and I had a lot of fun with this talk. Can you share with us what's next, what you have in the works that you can share that maybe we could uh, keep an eye out for? Um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've been working on some TV stuff. Uh, I mentioned a little bit of it earlier. Uh, working on turning the book into a docu-series where each chapter would be uh, an episode and then we'd bring in some experts to kind of tear it apart and tell Neil deGrasse me how stupid Tyson. I am. Yeah, he would be a, a great candidate for that. Absolutely. Maybe get Bill Nye in there to just flip me the bird and tell yeah. me I'm a dumbass. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, just uh, I started working on another book about two weeks ago. Um, nice. And it'll be different than this one, but I think still a continuation in some way uh I, I i don't really know yet how to describe that um and yeah a lot of the conferences i was gonna be at got pushed back because of the virgin soil pandemic we're dealing with but yeah. i was gonna be at uh contact in the desert and then this um scientific coalition of uap studies uh and i think those will still happen they'll just get pushed back a little bit so i mean everything's on hold everybody's life's on hold yeah uh, i guess yeah. with a podcast we could actually pretend like it's all better we could just start <laughs> saying well yes this will happen tomorrow and <laughs> whenever this comes out just create our own scenario yeah uh seems dangerous though since none of us know what's gonna happen yeah that's that's a scary thing right but hey if we're being visited that means we pulled through and we did it we, and we, we did, did it, it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we survived. But I want to thank you again, and hopefully when that does come out with that new book, I'll check it out, and perhaps we can do an episode then about that new book. Yeah, one sounds great. One more time for the listeners, where can they find your work? And again, it'll be in the description, but just for, for so they can hear it, your website, and so they can find your book and buy it. Yeah, sure. It's uh, idflyobj.com, I-D-F-L-Y-O-B-J.com. Um, and there's links to Amazon, Audible. I even have an Etsy page where there's like T-shirts and, and uh, koozies and stuff because I, right like, I like drinking beer with aliens on it. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's a good, a good jumping off point for all kinds of stuff. idflyobj.com. Right on. And again, Michael, thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. I had a lot of fun. 
And this is something I feel people should really look into and ask these questions because you do make a lot of good points in the book and it really just opens up your mind to other possibilities. I appreciate that. And uh, yeah, thanks for having me on. It was great talking to you as well. Thank you, Michael. Have a good night. Well, there you have it. Make sure to check out Michael's work, his book. I recommend it. Very, very informative. And it makes you really think outside the box. A lot of people don't dive into this realm of things, but I feel that we should be asking all these crazy questions and really diving into what the origins of humanity are, if truly these are interdimensional or intertime beings. Who knows, right? But make sure to check us out on social media at the Juan Juan Podcast. And as always, until next time.